good. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our monthly webinars on wireless risks and safer technology solutions. I'm Cece Doucette, the Director of Massachusetts for Safe Technology, and I'm so honored to have with us today Mary Bacon from Minnesotans for Safe Technology, and she's going to spend a few minutes sharing what they've been doing in Minnesota, and then she'll turn it back over to me and we will go through my slides. And for everybody who registered today, whether they can be with us at this time or not, we will be sending out my slides along with the recording. So you can go back and revisit what you learned today, um, do a deeper dive into the areas of the slides that interest you most and share with others. So um, let me go ahead and turn it over to Mary now. Mary, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cece. Appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to speak to everybody who's joining the group and who may be tuning in later to listen. So in Minnesota, um, our group, Minnesotans for Safe Technology, we're, we're fairly new. We've sort of been building up to becoming a, a, a decent sized small organization for uh, the past couple of years. And we got started as a small neighborhood group because Verizon was starting to put up small cells, small 5G small cell poles in front of people's homes in our neighborhood. And we knew that this was not gonna be good for our health. Minnesota is, Minneapolis is, already has fiber optic throughout the city, which is a much much safer way to connect and it's um, faster as well. But the Verizon wants to sell us 5G services through the through the towers. So that's why they're going up. And so just in a nutshell, we got started because we actually, have been physically stopping a few of the small cell poles going up in front of our neighbors' homes. We have found that our Occupy strategy is the only efficacious way to stop towers in our town. We hired a lawyer, um, Robert Berg Esquire from New York, to look into the situation for us to see if there was any legal way that we could object to towers coming in. And he found that the laws in Minnesota are so airtight already that there just was no legal basis for us to have any objection whatsoever to, to Verizon or any other company putting up as many 5G emitters anywhere that they entered where they wanted to, as many as they wanted to. So we found that standing in the way of finding out where a pole is going to be going up and standing in the way is the only way, the only way to do it. And we've been successful with three of them. I got involved in the first place because I was just walking down the street one afternoon, one morning actually. And here comes a big Verizon truck with about 10 of these poles loaded onto a trailer. And they're just going to put one up in front of our neighbor's home. She has multiple sclerosis and it was going to just be maybe 15 feet emitting 15 feet from her bedroom window. And we're like, no, this is not OK. We didn't know that it was going to be a cell tower. We thought that it was going to be just another light pole or something, because that's what the base looks like that they put in it. And actually, uh, the city permitting system, often that's what it's listed as is a light base. So they come up with the tower and they're just about to lift it up and put it on there. One of the neighbors runs out of her house. No, we don't want that there. And here I am walking, just happened to be serendipitously walking by. No, we don't want that there. And we just stood there. And so they drove away. They subsequently tried four more times and we refined our strategy very tightly to figure out through no parking signs, um, notices parking our cars in the way when they were going to be coming so that the neighbors could come out of the house and just stand in the way. They just briefly, they did, they went through the chain of command with the police department, the contractor's uh, boss came and he goes, uh, we're just gonna have y'all arrested. That's what we're gonna do. And so he called the police and the beat cop comes and then the um, 
sergeant comes and then the lieutenant comes and finally you know we're explaining how we're trying to work through our city council to get some new laws passed and they the lieutenant said uh no we're not arresting anybody they have a right to stand here it is their first amendment right so after four attempts of this one particular location they just gave it up they pulled the permit and so that's not going to be it's not going to be installed. And so we've done that uh, similar strategy in three different spots. And so our, our new strategy has been to get information from the city. So here's a report that we got from the city. This is um, 30 pages worth of cell tower permits locations that uh, each of these pages has about 60 locations on it. So we know where AT&T, uh, Mobile, Light, Sprint, Verizon, um, all of these companies are gonna be putting up towers. And so we've been looking up on the, on the uh, permit sites to find out, and also Google Maps to find out which ones have been installed and which ones haven't. And so then we can let neighbors know by dropping off a letter to their home to inform them that, and this is what the letter looks like, you know, the informational letter, we, we have found that Verizon has a plan to put a 5G poll on such such address in front of your home. And this is the name of the poll. And if you wanna do anything about it, here's the information to find out why you might wanna why you might not want that in front of your house, including um, you know, not only the, the emissions problem with the, with the health effects, but the property value devaluation from having one of these in front of your house. I mean, the realtors have been, have been in some areas have been noticing that this decreases property values by about 20%, which is pretty significant. When more people find out about these things, the more they don't want to buy the house that has it in right in you know in front of right in front of them. Wow, we are so grateful for everything you're teaching us, Mary. And it's just inspiring to know that even though the industry got in there and put laws in your state that make it so you can't fight these cell towers, that our First Amendment rights still protect us and that you guys have tested it out and mm -hmm. that it's working. So we right. are just so jazzed to have you it's with the, us. It's the only weak point that it, it's the only weak point that Verizon and the other cell companies have that we that we can find in in Minneapolis. Oh, well, keep at That's it. Keep one. us informed. Um, and thank you. And please thank your colleagues there. I know I had the privilege of presenting at a uh, library in Minneapolis some years ago. And I just mm -hmm. met the nicest people and a building biologist who's out there you know, boots on the ground, helping people to create safe indoor spaces. So thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, to hear more of Mary's story, we do a um, cable show twice a month. And Mary was my guest recently on Tech Safe, which you will find in the emails that I sent out. Most of you probably already have that video, but um, that's something for posterity too, to help people just learn what this issue is. So I'm going to go ahead and take the spotlight and then I'm going to start my, um, oh, let me see, how do I do this? Okay. Um, and Mary will continue to admit people. We'll do a presentation now for about an hour and a half, and then we will open it up for questions and answers at the end. If you have any questions you want to pop into the chat, you're welcome to. And if there's time beyond that, we can just open it up for discussion. So thank you so much, everybody, for being with us. And we are going to see my slides come up in just a moment. Mary, can you give me a nod if you can see my slides? I can see. Okay, great. So again, we'll send all these out to everybody who registered. Uh, anything that you see with a blue underline throughout the slides means that it's a link to the source information of what we're sharing with you. That MTPW after my name just means I had the privilege of earning a master's in technical and professional writing from Northeastern University, along with my bachelor's in uh, communication studies. And never ever did I imagine this is where my skill set would lead me. Um, but I'm very grateful. Being with people and teaching is my happy place. 
Uh, and so I fell down the rabbit hole with this issue back in, oh, I think it was 2013, after I had run our local education foundation for years, at the time when the wireless industry was pushing in their 21st century classroom. And so I ran campaign after campaign to get wireless technology into our schools. And then one night at book group, a girlfriend of mine who's an electrical engineer tipped us off that there could be biological effects from these invisible waves that are carrying our signal and data back and forth. So that caught me by surprise. And being a tech writer, I just went, huh, I wonder if there's any science to this. So I just started looking and folks, I didn't have to look far to find literally thousands of peer reviewed published scientific studies showing extensive biological harm. And we're gonna walk you through the science in just a little bit. So this was not an easy conversation to have with my schools because by then, well, with my hand in it, um, we had been bringing all this wireless tech into the schools. I was our grant coordinator. So I ran many campaigns to get this in. And so I started raising my hand going, hey, guys, I think we got a problem here. And I expected that our administrators, our school nurses, our town administrators would respond as if we had a gas leak in the science lab at the high school, right? Get the kids out of the building, fix the problem, and then let the teachers and the kids back in the building. But that's not at all what happened. I got crickets. And I couldn't understand it. Um, but later on, I discovered that the industry got in at the state level at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and they embedded all this new technology into the curriculum such that if schools are not adopting all of this, that will affect their evaluations, which in turn affect the funding for the schools. So it was not an easy conversation to have, but even a decade ago, the evidence was becoming so compelling that we have gotten ourselves into some pretty hot water with wireless tech. So in the end, our schools became the first in the nation to even have this little sign hanging in our classrooms with best practices for mobile devices. Turn everything off when it's not in use. Turn the Wi-Fi on only when it's needed and always place the mobile device on a solid surface, not on your lap or your body or in your pockets. And we'll walk you through some of the reasoning behind that too. So I didn't know it at the time. I thought maybe I was the first one figuring out this out locally. Um, but then down the road, I was told by one of the world's leading scientists that we were the first in the nation to accomplish something like this little sign with simple precautionary measures. Uh, so when I figured out that, yes, we have this sign hanging in all of our classroom, but they're not doing it. Then I went and I met with my legislators and my Senate, um, my Senator is Karen Spilka and she is now the president of the Massachusetts Senate. And back then she was a chairwoman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. And I met with her for local coffee hours and her district director. And I measured the radiation coming off of Senator Spilka's cell phone. And then I measured the radiation coming off of her district director's laptop and both devices went right off the charts into the alarming red area on my meter. And they're looking at me with wide eyes like, really? And I said, yes. And nobody has any idea that these wireless technologies operate using two-way radio frequency microwave radiation. So Senator Spilka put me with an attorney in her office and together Aaron Cardi and I whittled out a little bill that would just simply bring the right minds together at the state level, look at this issue, speak to the real experts, and decide what to do. Well, we have had legislation like that in Massachusetts for 10 years now. And because of the work that we've done to get people to send in testimony and to go in and give testimony, we have gotten um, a number of our bills out of committee favorably but then they peter out by the end of the session and have never get enacted into law. In New Hampshire, however, 
we brought it all the way home and they came out with a groundbreaking commission report documenting all the conflicts of interest with the wireless industry and our federal agencies and making 15 recommendations to move away from wireless tech to the much better, far faster, superior technology, as Mary mentioned, which is fiber optics right to the premises. And then you just pick up indoors with ethernet cables and adapters. So we have had legislation in Massachusetts for 10 years, and we'll tell you a little bit later what we have here, what Minnesota has, and what some others around the country are doing. Then somebody found the work that I was doing with our schools and the legislation. And in Europe, um, there was a couple, Brett and Lynn West. Brett was an EMT in his earlier life. So he understood a lot of the biological effects that you know environmental agents can have. And he's very self-taught. He reads physics books for fun, right? And he discovered that the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, which is the medical group that gets the conundrum cases that regular doctors haven't been trained on, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine in 2012 sent a position statement to school superintendents saying, please do not allow wireless into the schools. Use only hardwired technology. Now, Brett's job in the UK now um, was to put wireless systems in major construction projects. And so Brett sees this notice from the American Academy of Environmental Medicine and goes, well, what is this? So he falls down the rabbit hole and starts doing his investigation into the science. And he discovers thousands of studies showing harm. And he thought, wow, I know technology and I know a bit about health. I can help people just fix it to remediate, to learn how to hardwire their technology. And so he thought he would start a side business, but he quickly understood that you can't fix it because nobody even knows the issue exists. So he circled back around to the point that we need to have education before we can have meaningful change. So he reached out to one of our nation's leading scientists, Dr. Devra Davis, who is the founder and president of the Environmental Health Trust, which is arguably the world's greatest uh, think tank and database on the wireless issue. She is also a Nobel Peace Prize co-laureate on climate change. She helped to get smoking out of our airplanes. So she's really at the top of her game. Brett reached out to Dr. Davis and said, may we ask your permission to reference the Environmental Health Trust database in these courses that we wanna develop to quickly teach the public what this issue is. So Dr. Davis said, absolutely. And you might want to talk to this woman, Cece Doucette, who's making inroads in the school space and in legislation. So Brett and Lynn reached out to me. And at the same time, they reached out to Dr. Miko Ahonen out of Finland. Now, Dr. Ahonen is a PhD scientist and researcher um, and educator. And so for a number of months, me, Miko, Brett, and Lynn just hit it hard. We all had an, enough of a break in our schedules that we could really focus on building a little online course where we could train the masses quickly. So we have this course that can be completed in about a half an hour that anybody is welcome to go take. We charge like less than the cost of a movie ticket. I think it's about $15 now. Um, and for schools, uh, we will, you know, work with you if you need to adjust that pricing. We'll give you a bulk discount. And then we have something called a Robin Hood model, where if you work for a company and if you license the course to train your own employees, we will grant you the opportunity to donate licensing to a local school so you can create a win-win um, for the children, for the educators, for your employees, and for the community at large. So, so I was really honored that Dr. Davis knew my work and put me in touch with what became wireless education. And then when my bill came up for public hearing, Dr. Davis had brought a panel of experts to the Massachusetts State House to talk about the need for right to know legislation. This is going to be like tobacco gambling, pornography, drugs, alcohol. 
Adults will make their choices, but they deserve an informed consent. And we as adults are responsible for the well-being of the collective children in our society. So I was um, contacted to say this panel of world-leading experts were coming to the Massachusetts State House to do a right to know presentation. So Dr. Deborah Davis organized this. Um, she's the Nobel Peace Prize co laureate on climate change. She brought with her Frank Clegg, who's the retired president of Microsoft Canada. So I'm sitting there at our state house going, wow, we have a captain of industry here. And scientists had approached him and gone to his home in Canada and measured the radiation and taught him what was happening. And so he sought out a dozen of the world's leading experts on this and came back and said, yeah, here in North America, in Canada, their safety code six doesn't protect them. And here in the United States, the Federal Communications Commission's guidelines for radiation exposure, they don't protect us either. So I was sitting there listening to a world leading scientist. I was listening to a captain of industry. And then Dr. Davis brought in Dr. R.S. Sharma from India. And Dr. Sharma is the gentleman in the Indian government who does scientific investigation. He's written research papers on wireless radiation and the biological health. And he did a lot of the sperm investigation on what it's doing when we put ourselves in this pulsation of microwave radiation. We'll talk a little more about that when we look at the science. But in India, their public radiation limits used to be way up here where ours still are here in North America. And at least on paper, Dr. Sharma was able to get India to reduce their public radiation exposure limits by 90%. So that showed to us that with political will, we can indeed make important inroads on this issue. And then we also had Janet Newton from the Electromagnetic Radiation Paul, uh, Institute. And I think she was married to a gentleman whose job it was to go up on the rooftops, maybe in HVAC or maintenance on the antennas that are up there, but he wound up getting very sick from what I understand. So she had been doing a lot of activism work to get people aware and to start alerting our federal legislators that we need to do better with public policy to protect us. And then Dr. Katherine Steiner Adair is an international child psychologist who happens to be from Massachusetts. So she joined this panel too. And she said, wherever she goes all over the world, she hears the same thing from first grade, kindergarten, second grade teachers, that these children today are expecting their teachers to be edutainers. They're losing their ability to concentrate and to focus. Um, it seems that the areas of the human brain where math and science develop were still at that point developing on point, but all those other areas in the human brain where we develop our capacity to be human, to have empathy, to use reason, um, to recognize when somebody's in jeopardy and, and help. You know, if a child falls on the playground, why aren't they turning around and helping their peers? She said these children need to be going outside, connecting with nature, going into deeper and deeper levels of imaginative play, connecting with their peers, connecting with the trusted adults, making eye contact, having movement. And today, so many children and so many parents don't know any better than to leave us in front of a screen for far too many hours in our life. So it was really wonderful to talk, uh, to hear from Dr. Katherine Steiner Adair. She, had, she has written a book called uh, The Big Disconnect. And she takes it from the wee little ones all the way up through the high school grades and what this excessive use of technology is doing to our development. So incredible, incredible resources. And we've got all of this at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. Um, when I went to the State House for that presentation, it was really gratifying for me because for the first two years of my journey, I was the only person I knew who could talk about this. And honestly, I was still connecting the dots and I wasn't even sure of what I was saying or finding, but I knew we were onto something. 
So to go to a standing room only presentation at our state house with people from all over the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it was just so fantastic to know that I wasn't alone anymore and that others all around me understood what was going on. So from there, over the years, I connected with a lot of other people and founded Massachusetts for Safe Technology. We invite people to go there as a resource. You will find the science, you will find action items, you'll see what we've been doing at the state level. And on our news page, you will see a lot of really good uh, programming, either from cable programs, from articles that are written, um, from publications like the Boston Globe and other local papers that are picking up these stories that mainstream media won't touch. So lots of great resources to share with you. I like to include this next link because somebody down at the National Institutes of Health found my work and asked me to co-chair the technology panel for the Health in Buildings Roundtable Conference. And the reason I like to share this is that we were all limited to about eight or 10 minutes in our talks. So they're very quick and heavily fact-based. So I give the opening remarks. We had Frank Clegg from Microsoft Canada fly in. He was on our panel. We had Dr. Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, -L, who's one of the world's leading scientists. And in his eight minutes, he went right through the mechanisms of harm, which the industry for years got away with saying, oh, there's no mechanism of harm identified. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Well, well now we know many different ways that this radiation biologically damages us. And we're going to teach you that today. Uh, we also had Theodora Scarato, who's the executive director of Dr. Deborah Davis's Environmental Health Trust. And she used her eight minutes to show us that we're way behind the eight ball here in the U.S. because the manufacturers are here. Um, but other countries have already taken meaningful action to protect their citizens and especially the children. And uh, so terrific resources. We had Peter Sullivan join that panel. Now, I found Peter's work through a talk that he gave online. And he was, in his younger days, a fighter pilot like Top Gun for our military. So he's up, way up above the earth in the very high natural electromagnetic fields, which when you're that close to him can be very dangerous. And inside of a plane that has radar all over the plane and then all this wireless instrumentation inside the plane. And this technology came out of our military as radar around the time of World War II. So it's been used for decades by our militaries. Um, and just, you know, in the last few decades, the industry brought it into the commercial sector without any biological safety testing. So what intrigued me about Peter Sullivan is when I watched one of his talks, he was sharing that he became electromagnetically sensitive to the point where he had dropped an unhealthy amount of weight. His teeth were starting to get brittle. And then when his two sons came up through the preschool years, each was diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And after I listened to Peter and what he had done with his family, he said a lot of families with um, autism will clean out the diet so you're not adding additional body burden through the chemicals that are used in growing our conventional foods today. So get away from that, go to a clean organic diet. And then he went so far as to do the heavy metal detox to pull all that toxicity you know, right out of the body. And then he said, today though, what I would advise people to do first is to do the digital detox and start with a 12 hour, no radiation in your home at night program. And he said that his two sons are now highly productive, college educated young men in our society and neither one of them is on the autism spectrum anymore. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know that was an option. But apparently there's something called de novo mutations, meaning it didn't come from mom's bloodline. It didn't come from dad's. It came from somewhere in the environment. Clean up the environment. And there are amazing, amazing health gains that can be had. And we don't want to overpromise. We know that genetically and based on our experiences in this world, every single body is different. But when you start addressing these environmental exposures, Time and again, we see incredible 
recoveries. So feel free to share that resource. And then one of the biggest gaps that we had when I first got started on this is we could tell that there was a rapidly increasing number of people who were developing electromagnetic sensitivities. And we didn't have any way to train our healthcare practitioners. So we are so very grateful that in 2019, Dr. Lynn Patrick um, executed the first EMF or electromagnetic fields. Those are the pulsations that are coming from these man-made sources, electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic radiation, sometimes it's called microwave radiation. It all means the same thing. We're kind of in hot water with these man-made energies. So we did another EMF medical conference in 2021 and bless Elizabeth Kelly, who helped the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act recognize electrical sensitivities two decades ago. She took on organizing this EMF medical conference 2021 with world leading doctors, scientists, building biologists, and I was so honored to be brought in to speak on state and local policy. So if you look at the year 2021, we were just about to kick off our conference when the pandemic hit. So we had to completely pivot, find the funding, get everybody's um, lectures pre-recorded, and then during the conference, and we had to learn how to do this all on a platform that was not meeting people in person. So we did a virtual conference, but the good news is the uh, 21.5 or 24.5 continuing medical education credits that were offered through the conference, those expired in July of 2023. Beyond that, Libby Kelly took the entire conference and has now put it out on YouTube and Vimeo at no charge. Every single one of us and every one of our healthcare teams, every one of our first responders in our towns can now go get professionally trained on the EMF medical conference on their own time. The lectures range from maybe 18 minutes to a half an hour to an hour with discussion panels in between. You can just schedule those into your calendar, maybe do one a day. And then by the end of it, you will have a very complete understanding of what this radiation is and how to recognize it and how to remediate it. So please share this with your healthcare teams. Most of them are in the dark. So here's how my school became the first in the nation to even have this little sign with precautionary measures. Anybody who's watching this with us today, if you have an iPhone, I invite you to take it out right now and go into settings. And for those who don't have the iPhone, you can just do a quick search on RF exposure on your make and model of your phone, be it an Android or a Google phone, um, RF exposure. So look at this. Our friends at the Environmental Health Trust have pulled out a lot of the fine print warnings that come with all of our devices. In the iPad, it had said, this can cause seizures, blackouts, and eye strain, but who would ever know it's in this fine print? So from your settings in an iPhone, scroll down a little ways and hit general. Go to the bottom of general and hit legal and regulatory. When the next screen comes up about four down, you'll see RF exposure. And now we're in the legal fine print that the industry politely calls energy, radio frequency radiation. And in that fine print disclaimer, they tell us two really important things. One, this device was tested at a distance from the body. And two, they say to use a hands-free option. So, to reduce your exposure, basically don't touch a wireless emitting radiation device. They say to use a speakerphone or to use the headset that's provided. I'm gonna stop sharing just for a second to give us a little encouragement. Everything that we've broken, we know how to fix. So one of the properties of this microwave radiation is it amplifies around metal. So if you are plugging a traditional headset into a cell phone that is radiating, you're gonna plug it into a radiating device 
The radiation is going to hop on the wire and party right on up to your brain, right? So what you want to look for if you're interested in reducing your exposures is something called a hollow tube or an air tube headset. So look at this. There's no metal at the top that you put into your ears, just plastic. And then it's got these little ferrite beads that break the radiation that travel up the wire. So by the time it gets up to your head, there's no radiation going right to you. And it's got the volume and the muting, you know, great audio control. And then these little hollow or air tubes operate much like a doctor's stethoscope. You get great acoustics, but without the radiation coming up to your head. And then it's got a nice long cord on it so you can plug it into your device and set that device at a distance from your body. Um, I just realized I didn't bring my cell phone in here with me. Let me go grab it because I want to give you a live demonstration of this invisible toxin. So here in my house, knowing what I know, once I stopped circling my tail and really read the science, so I had enough courage to, to swim against the tide because by now the industry has conditioned everybody. As soon as somebody says wireless is harmful, we want you to think tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, right? So when you open this conversation with somebody, Showing them the legal fine print in their own device is perhaps the quickest way to take it from tinfoil hat conspiracy theory to, holy smokes, that's been in there all the time. And now you've got their attention. Then the second best thing to do is to show them this invisible toxin. So this is a radio frequency radiation broadband detection meter. And in the scientific literature, they want us to be at the number 10. The unit of measurement is something called a microwatt per square meter. I don't know what that was, but basically in three feet of air, how much radiation do we think we could get away with? Mind you, there's no safe level in the scientific literature, but if you can stay under 10, even people with electrical sensitivities, most of them seem to do okay in that environment. So, this is the meter that was recommended at the EMF medical conference. Doctors are putting it into their practices. Citizens are buying it or going together with friends and getting it. Um, it's the middle number on here. I know you probably can't see it, but it's called the max. What's the maximum spike of this pulse of radiation that comes at us from all of our wireless? Right now in my home, I'm at a three but I'm gonna take my cell phone out of airplane mode. I keep it in airplane mode as a rule and I just forward any cell phone calls to my landline. But by now, everybody in my world knows I don't check my cell phone, but a couple of times a week. So get me through my computer, which is usable through ethernet cables or call me on my landline. Um, so I'm gonna take us out of airplane mode and show you what happens with this wireless radiation. We went from the low green, nice area of slight exposure up to the extreme exposure. You see how it's popping around and making all these horrible noises? Um, oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Give me just, oh boy. Give me one sec. Okay. I put it back in airplane mode and watch. It's going to dissipate and go right back down. So the reason why this went so crazy is the industry gives us these devices with multiple antennas. So in different places on this phone, there are separate antennas. Each one is constantly pulsing for a handshake with the nearest cell tower or router to keep your connection. So you've got a cellular and a data antenna, a Bluetooth antenna, a Wi-Fi antenna, a locator antenna, a hotspot antenna. And for anyone who didn't know any better and bought into the 5G hype and upgraded your phone, you've got an array of additional antennas. And again, the message today is not no technology. It's safe and responsible technology. And we're going to teach you how to get there. So when I took my phone out of airplane mode, all those antennas came online and started flashing. We were at three microwatts in my safe home here. We went up to 3,180,000 microwatts, 3 million. 
and probably higher, but that's as high as this particular meter goes. 3 million, and they want us to be at 10 or less in our sleeping areas like our homes. So that's not great. But once we know better, we can do better. And knowing that we can measure these exposures is huge, huge for us. Because once you can see it, then we can do something about it. So one of the things I did in my community is I was like, whoa, there's meters out there. Let's get one. Let's get two. Let's um, go after a grant in my town and get one for the schools and get one for the library so everybody can have a meter at their disposal to measure. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, again, at this point in time, I think uh, I started with this like in 2015. It took me three grant cycles with our select board, which is like our city council here in Ashland, Massachusetts. Took me three grant cycles for them to approve the funding to put one meter on loan in our public library. So there's a whole story behind there, but we became the first in the United States to put this on loan in our library. Now, I got the grant back in 2016 for $400. And this conversation today is so much easier to have because uh, with technology, our libraries are having to reinvent themselves because not as many people come to this community center at the library to take books out anymore. So libraries are reinventing and now most will offer a library of things. And so my daughter, for example, has been on a wait list to get a power washer from her library. I know ours has a metal, uh, metal detector. They've got board games, they've got puzzles, you know, all sorts of cool things you can go borrow from your library. And when the energy industry was taking away our much healthier incandescent light bulbs and replacing them with those swirly CFLs and LED bulbs that throw off another unhealthy form of man-made electrical energy. Um, they used as one of their marketing strategies to donate a kilowatt meter to our libraries in a case that got barcoded and was loaned out to the citizenry. So that's how I got the idea. So we became the first in the U.S. to put one on loan in the Ashland Public Library here. The Newton Public Library followed suit. There's a couple others. And then recently, so I got the Acoustimeter back in 2016. Today, I would recommend the Safe and Sound Pro 2 from Safe Living Technologies. And again, this is recommended by the EMF Medical Conference, but it's also one that you can plug in. And if you are electrically sensitive, you could just leave it running in your home. So as soon as somebody comes in your house with something on them that's transmitting, you could ask them to please put it in airplane mode. So... Um, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, their library just outright bought one and put it into circulation. There's a lawsuit happening out in Pittsfield where Verizon put a cell tower on top of a neighborhood that made 17 children and adults so sick that they had to abandon their homes or stay and become ill. And I was just heartbroken this week to learn that the second person with cancer has just died from the radiation. So there's a big lawsuit out in Pittsfield. Um, I just got word this month that Sunderland in Massachusetts also got the Safe and Sound Pro 2 meter. And if you talk to your library about this and they say, well, gosh, we'd love to, but we don't have the funding in this year's budget. If you contact the Environmental Health Trust, they've got a small grant fund and may still be able to help you fund that if your librarian, it can't be you, it's got to be your librarian. If your librarian reaches out to them, I think they just helped to fund the one in Sunderland. So please know, again, we've got solutions at every turn. One of the last bastions of independent reporting left in our country is our local cable stations, which ironically are funded in part by the telecom industry. Um, but so far, we've been able to do independent reporting. And our local cable station, WACA-TV in Ashland, was very gracious to send resources to my house. And we did a walkthrough of what common exposures look like today from the microwave oven to the printer, to the keyboard, the mouse, the computers, the laptop. Um, 
We did a walkthrough to show you where you might look for the exposures in your own setting and then offer suggestions for what to do. I had been brought into the Worcester, Massachusetts cable station a couple of times to help with uh, a few episodes they were doing on the utility smart meters that were rolled out there. And ultimately the director at WCCA TV said, Cece, you just need to have your own program. So I was so humbled and so excited to use my skill set with tech writing and with communication. And so now twice a month, I bring guests in, and that's this is the little cable show that I invited Mary, our co-host today, to join me on. But we've got, I think, ooh, 32 episodes recorded so far with doctors, with scientists, with the folks who organize the EMF Medical Conference, and sadly, with far too many people who have been injured by these man-made microwave radiation exposures. So um, don't be shy about talking to your own local cable station. If you wanna help educate your community, I would be so honored to join you and do a program with you. Um, okay, so we tell people, don't take our word on any of this. Go get to know the science for yourself. So we're gonna show you some of the highlights of the science. And we'll start with the long-term effects. And on the short, on the second slide, we'll show you what some of the short-term effects are. For years, the industry got away with saying, oh, there's no mechanism of harm identified, so let's just keep doing what we're doing. And they were banking on the cancer studies taking decades because that's how long cancer used to take to materialize. But now we're seeing it on coming on earlier and earlier. So about two decades ago, our government, through the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, they are where the National Toxicology Program is housed. Now, our U.S. National Toxicology Program is known as the gold standard, perhaps throughout the world, on toxics research. They did a, 20, or a $30 million study starting two decades ago to see if cell phones could be hazardous because they came to market with no safety testing. They had an unprecedented three-day peer review at the National Institutes of Health where world-leading scientists and doctors whose life's work is microwave radiation joined them and weighed in. And at the end of the day, our own government, the U.S. National Toxicology Program, determined clear evidence of cancerous tumors Clear evidence is the highest of five categories that they could assign. Clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage. Um, and, you know, the industry gets a hold of this and they'll spin it and say, oh, that's just one study. You need more than one study. Well, right on the heels of our National Toxicology Program results, the Ramazzini Institute in Italy concluded another 20 some odd million dollar study on cell tower base stations. So now we've got it coming from both directions. Guess what? They found the same things that we did. Cancers, DNA damage, and more. So DNA, as we know, is the roadmap to grow a proper anything from a human to a plant, to a pollinator, to any living biome on the planet. And this radiation is damaging the very fabric of our lives. Oh, and to paraphrase the cotton industry, you know, they've had these ads going for a long time about the fabric of our lives. I was watching something on TV the other night and I was just tickled to see an ad that they did um, where these uh, 20 or 30 somethings are all gathered together out for a meal and they all put their cell phones in a pile at the end of the table. And their message was unplug, let's have tech free Fridays, let's really connect with the fabric of our lives, which is each other. So that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it damages DNA. It causes infertility. I mentioned that there are many studies that have been done, changed the DNA, slowed the motility, caused far fewer sperm to be viable or apoptosis, programmed cell death in four hours of exposure. That's the set of studies that got me on my feet because when I was learning this, we as a family were at a juncture where we were sending our oldest daughter off to college and she had her MacBook, which she used right on top of her reproductive organs. Our youngest was just going into high school and for Christmas, we thought we'd give her a leg up and gave her her own laptop. 
which of course she was using right on top of her reproductive organs. So that was where as a mom, I realized we've gotten ourselves into a pickle here and I don't see anybody coming out to help us. Neurotoxicity, attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Dr. Hugh Taylor, who heads up the OBGYN program at Yale Medical School, he has done some of the rodent studies. You do rodents because it's unethical to test on humans. And he found that when they expose the pregnant mice to wireless radiation from a cell phone, those pups came out and developmentally started displaying behaviors that looked a lot like a child with ADD, ADHD, kind of bouncing off the walls of the cages, not a care in the world. Dr. Martha Herbert, who founded the Autism Lab at Massachusetts General Hospital, she is a Harvard pediatric neurologist who's recently retired but she sees huge connections between what we know scientifically happens when you radiate the brain and what is happening to these children and now adults who wind up on the autism spectrum. One of the papers that Dr. Martin Paul has published deals with Alzheimer's and where like cancer, it used to come on many years late into our lives. Alzheimer's what? 70, 80, 90 year olds. Now we're seeing it in our 60s, in our 50s, in our 40s, in our 30s, and even in some cases, people in their 20s are developing Alzheimer's disease. So, how long can we continue to contaminate the environment of the brain? Um, we'll talk in a minute about why we don't know this through mainstream media, but we're very grateful when well-known groups like the Environmental Working Group get funding so that they can put experts on this topic. As a mom, I first learned about the Environmental Working Group because every year they put out something called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. Those are fact sheets about pesticides and other chemicals used in growing food conventionally that are causing a lot of harm to our brains and our bodies. So I knew about the Environmental Working Group and I'm just delighted that they now have guidances that they've issued. Here's one for protecting kids from wireless uh, radiation in schools and at home. Here's another one about the central nervous system or the neurological effects. Um, they have one on cell phones. So know your audience. Um, we don't wanna come off as the newly baptized and tell people what they have to do because that's not how people learn. If we give them a reason to get out of the conversation, if we come at it too intensely, they're gonna be marking the exits because everybody is dependent on their devices today. So let's be gentle with ourselves and those who we wanna share this information with. Know your audience. If there are doctors or scientists or engineers, we're gonna have a ton of resources for you. But if they're parents, these environmental working group fact sheets may resonate well. And folks, We've got to protect our kiddos. They are not just little adults. Developmentally, they're still under construction. And with great thanks to Dr. Om Gandhi and his colleagues, they did this modeling to show that inch per inch, children are absorbing much more of this radiation than you and I. And a couple of reasons are that their brains have a higher water content and this radiation, just like our microwave ovens, interact with the water molecules and create heat that can then do damage. But also children's skulls are not fully developed. So when you put a cell phone, these head models are turned sideways in this graphic. The little yellow dot is the ear. When you put that cell phone up to your head, this microwave radiation is pulsating into your brain about a third of the way through. Who knows with 5G and additional antennas in there, it could be going even further in. Um, on a 10 year old, their thinner skull about two thirds of the way into the brain. And on a five-year-old child, it's penetrating almost the entire brain of that child. So please never ever give an actively radiating device to a child. Put everything in airplane mode, turn off all the antennas in your settings and measure to make sure you got them all and then hand the device over to a child, but never a radiating device. Short-term effects in the science. So it's important to recognize that Elizabeth Kelly, who did the EMF Medical Conference, 
and her colleagues decades ago worked with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and they recognize electromagnetic sensitivities. Who would know? They have accommodation re re uh, recommendations through JAN, the Jobs Area Network, and other areas that fall under the ADA umbrella. Um, but here's what we know is happening today. This insomnia that so many people have. Sleeping used to be what children and teenagers did best, right? And now we have kids who don't sleep right anymore. Well, it's remarkable when you simply turn off these wireless exposures, how many children and adults start sleeping through the night again. One of the mechanisms of harm that we now know is that we are light beings, meaning that we operate through our circadian rhythm off of the natural cycle of light and dark. In the wee hours of darkness, the pineal gland in our brain, and I'm not a doctor, but this is about as technical as I'll get, the pineal gland in the brain releases melatonin. Melatonin's job is to go in and regulate our sleep, but also to work with the bloodstream to escort the toxins out of the body from everyday cell repair and regeneration. So here's what's happening for many people. The brain in the middle of the night is over there going, okay, when it's it gonna get dark so I can release that melatonin because it sees this man-made light energy form as the lights are on and it's waiting for darkness. So let's get rid of the radiation during our sleeping hours for starters and see if people start doing better. Headaches, stabbing, searing headaches, migraines that our doctors can't figure out, nosebleeds, ear bleeds, fatigue where you just lost your giddy up and go, right? Chronic fatigue syndrome and pain from unidentified sources. Well, here's another mechanism of harm that scientists like Dr. Magda Havis and others have um, identified. When we're in a state of homeostasis, which means that's how our bodies were meant to be working, we have our red blood cells floating around, looking like little ovals, um, bringing oxygen up to all of our systems and organs and keeping us humming along quite nicely. What we see even under a high powered microscope is that when we expose our cells to wireless radiation pulsations of microwave you know, emissions, it's not only changing the shape from a nice little round or oval to something that resembles a bottle cap, but because this is an electromagnetic field, these things start magnetizing and all of a sudden, we see our red blood cells glomming up and not being able to get oxygen to where they need to go to keep us working properly. So that is called the Rouleau, the Rouleau formation. And in my little brain, Rouleau sounds a lot like Rolos, which were those caramel candies that were chocolate caramels stacked up in a little sleeve. Well, picture that as our red blood cells glomming together and stacking up like that. And then you can't get the Rolos to where they need to go, right? Um, so it's that Rouleau formation that is another well-documented um, effect that we've got going on here. Skin abnormalities. Who knew, but we have little antennas in the surface of our skin. Every living creature is meant to be synchronized to the earth and our little antennas help to regulate perhaps our body temperature. Are we too hot or too cold? Are we too cold? And tell us to either get indoors or add some more layers or go cool off before we get into trouble. What we see in the scientific literature and industry even admits that 5G affects the skin, um, we see it dysregulating us and our skin feeds into all the other organs in our system. So a lot of people will say, gee, you know, you're right. When I put that cell phone up to my head, I wind up with this hot ear. Some people get the hot ear, they get tingling, they get a burning sensation. Uh, they, their skin might start turning red. So pay attention. This is what's going on for a lot of people. And then we are bioelectrical beings, right? We do EEGs, we do EKGs. Those measure our organs' electrical pulsations. 
So what happens when we start overpowering our natural electrical signaling with all of this man-made radiation? Well, it's not uncommon that people's hearts start beating out of their chest. They may have arrhythmias, their you know, blood pressure may go too high or too low, depending on what their own body is doing. Um, so you want to know what the earth pulses? There's something called Schumann's resonance. And this scientist, Dr. Schumann, figured out that the earth has this beautiful healing pulsation of electromagnetic radiation that pulses at 7.83 times per second or 7.83 hertz. So this lovely little pulsation, if we can get back outside and connect to the earth's natural electromagnetic field, that can go a long way in helping to reset our bodies from all this electro pollution. So get back out in nature, connect to the earth as often as you can. Um, so 7.83 times a second. You want to guess what we've done with wireless radiation? Anything that's operating in the megahertz range means 1 million cycles per second. So a million times a second, we're getting pulsated with microwaves. If your Wi-Fi is in the 2.4 megahertz range, that's 2.4 million times per second you're getting walloped with this. And now we've gotten so fancy up in the gigahertz range. Giga means billions. So a billion times per second, you're getting jackhammered with the spiked pulse magnetic electric radiation pollution. And we wonder why we don't feel so good anymore. We're supposed to be at 7.83, not at millions or billions getting overpowered by electro smog. Cognitive impairment, anger, behavior issues, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. I'll tell you guys, it was heartbreaking at the EMF medical conference to hear the doctors saying, if we don't get ahead of this, we can very well expect more increase in what we've been seeing lately in society with these anger outbursts, with the mass shootings. We had reports as the kids were let back into the schools after the pandemic. And what did we do in the pandemic? We issued every student a wireless tablet to access their education. And in many homes, they were given unfettered access to that tablet while mom and dad worked from home and tried to keep the peace. So the kids spent a lot more time on these tablets exposing themselves with no safety training. And it's not rocket science to fix. All you have to do is get an ethernet cable and an adapter, $20, $30, you plug it all in and turn off the antennas and, and then you have responsible technology. So yeah, the doctors were saying we can expect many more of these outbursts. And when the kids went back to school in Massachusetts, I saw three different school districts in the news reporting that these kids were literally beating on their classmates with the tablets. They are losing their ability to reason. They're losing their ability to self-soothe. And they're developing anger and all these other neurological symptoms. Um, and I was chatting with a woman at my yoga class at the gym. And it turns out she was a teacher at the local high school in the town next door. And she said, yeah, one of my colleagues is out on disability right now because one of the kids beat her up with their tablet. So it's happening, folks. We can't wait. There is no cavalry coming. We need to learn about this, study it, find the courage, make changes, and then help our communities. And sadly, as I said, it's not just you and I, it's every single biological cell on the planet is adversely impacted by this radiation. But again, for every problem we've created, there are solutions. Our friends at the Environmental Health Trust have recently launched this new website called Wildlife, Wireless, and the Environment, where you can quickly look at the science and the solutions. So our pollinators and our birds, just like our little antennas, they have antennas in their brains or their beaks that um, keep them synchronized to the Earth's electromagnetic field. But when we introduce this giant layer of electropollution, 
we find that the pollinators being so tiny, sometimes are just getting fried directly. Other times they can't find their way back to their hives. Um, birds having trouble finding their way back to their nest. Uh, in The Hague in the Netherlands, when 5G was getting tested there, there were reports of hundreds of birds literally dropping from the sky. So we have to learn. And energy consumption. So for those who are concerned with climate control, way back in 2012, a you know, dozen years ago, a Greenpeace analyst crunched the numbers and said, if the cloud were a country, it would be the fifth largest consumer of energy in the world. And that was 12 years ago. And look at everything that they've pushed in on us since then. So, um, uh, one of our colleagues, Katie Stinger, has documented the mineral extractions that go on down in the Congo and elsewhere and all the human atrocities that go hand in hand with that. Once we understand that there are dozens of these extracted minerals in every single one of our electronic devices, most of us would never just go buy the bright, shiny new object that they're spinning up. We would use everything to its full and complete useful life and then make sure to recycle it in the end. Data warehouses, networks, personal devices, all of these are consuming vast quantities of energy. Streaming is a huge consumer of energy. So please, let's learn to do it differently. Let's learn to download anything we wanna watch and go into airplane mode. And once it's on your device, everything that's there is for you to enjoy your music, your games, your movies, you know, any other entertainment you've got on there. Enjoy it, but again, be careful with what you're doing. It's really bad for our eyes to be looking at small screens at close range. Cast it out onto your big television set or something. Every time we send and receive, every time we charge and recharge and recharge these wireless devices, we're using a lot of energy. And then we've all been talked into all these apps that sound so cool and fun or even useful, but are we really using them? If the answer is no, please get rid of them because they're in the background consuming energy to do updates continuously back there. So again, the message is not no technology, it's safe and responsible technology. But my big head scratcher was if little me can just go look for this and find volumes of evidence of harm. Surely somebody must have our backs on this. So again, I got started in 2013. In 2015, Harvard Law School Center for Ethics came up with this free online 59 page report called Capture Captured Agency. How the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. So I love the graphic they put on the cover of their report. It's a revolving door, and that's what many of our federal agencies today have become. The industry gets in. They become our commissioners in our agencies, our directors, and then they leave, and then they go back out and work for industry. A lot of our politicians do the same thing. They get seduced by industry, and then at the end of their political career, they go work for industry. So as I'm reading the captured agency report, I'm going, oh, here's my missing piece of the puzzle. There is no cavalry coming. Nobody is protecting us at the federal level, and there are very few protections at the state level. We have got to address this at the local level and inside of our own homes. Um, that came out in 2015, and it still holds very true. ProPublica came out with another good article some years later on how the FCC is shielding the cell phone companies. So it's not just the FCC. The Food and Drug Administration is who commissioned that $30 million study with the National Toxicology Program that found clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage. That should have triggered the FDA to get public policy in place to protect you and I and the environment. Instead, the gentleman who today is in charge of radiation at the FDA, he's not the same person who did the study 20 years ago. Those guys have long since retired or passed away. But we've got this Dr. Jeffrey Shuren in charge at the FDA 
he went over to his colleagues at the FCC and said, eh, we don't really believe that study. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. And one might ask, what would ever possess Dr. Shuren to do that? Well, again, you don't have to look very far, but you will discover that Dr. Shuren is married to a woman who's a partner in a law firm that represents big Wi-Fi and other big industries out there. So we have conflicts of interest that go all the way up to the top at the World Health Organization, at the United Nations. Um, back in 2011, the World Health Organization investigated man-made electromagnetic fields and radio frequency, and they determined this at that time should be classified as a group 2B possible human carcinogen. There's five groupings. This was in the middle. So it wasn't nothing. This was in the middle. And what was missing in 2011 were the animal studies, which we have now completed, that found clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage. So the scientists who are qualified to weigh in on this are calling for this to be changed from a group 2B to a group 1 known human carcinogen. So I was presenting at the wellness committee at Dover Sherborne High School here in the town next to mine. And as I'm presenting the facts, somebody with their tablet at the conference table was fact checking me. And if you search World Health Organization electromagnetic fields, you will get some old stuff come up first that says, eh, it's inconclusive, let's keep doing what we're doing you will be hard pressed to find that right now the World Health Organization has reopened their investigation, not only for cancers, but for the impact on children, for the elderly, for those with electromagnetic sensitivities, infertility, and what is it doing to our environment? Um, but again, there is corruption all the way up at the World Health Organization, unless you knew, how would you know there's two groups there? that are addressing EMFs. One is a self-appointed industry group, and the other are the real qualified experts who would like to have a say in this, but it looks like the industry is cherry-picking cherry who they're going to allow to weigh in on their new investigation. So sadly, it goes all the way up to the top. So that is pretty much all the bad news. Um, but like I said, we have solutions for everything. So let's first look at what you can personally choose to do to begin reducing your exposures. So right now, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, our CDC, already has a really good set of instructions for what to do with radiation. And it's three-pronged. One says... Spend as little time as you can being radiated. Two, create as much distance from a radiating emission as you can. And three, if you can't get away from it, you better shield yourself, which is why we wear a lead apron when we go and we get an x-ray done. It's why a lot of people choose to put sunscreen on if they're gonna spend an excessive amount of time out in the sun. We would never leave our kids out in the sun for 24 hours unprotected. Um, so again, we have captured federal agencies. The CDC used to have some good information up. They got some pressure from industry. It's now been taken down. But for ionizing radiation, which is the kind that can break the atom, like x-rays, like the Earth's high you know, stratospheric energies, um, like the sun, they have that three-pronged approach, time, distance, and shielding. Well, that should all be applied to these man-made energies as well. So let's see what we can do. If you look at your router, you will find that you have ethernet ports in it. And that can be the router that's sitting somewhere in their house. It could be the wireless access points that have been installed in the ceilings of all the classrooms or many of the classrooms in our children's schools. They've all got ethernet ports in them. All you need to do is get an ethernet cable, a nice long one to go down to where you're at the device level. Um, if you have to buy new ones, personally, I had a whole box of them shoved away in my basement, so we didn't really have to buy much. Um, but if you're gonna buy a new one, look for something that is shielded. All that means is there's a foil liner around the wires inside the plastic. That foil liner keeps 
the low level um, electric and magnetic fields that are whipping through the wire from emanating out into our living spaces. That dirty electricity in itself can emanate six to eight feet through the walls and into our living spaces. So um, just another form of fun man-made electromagnetic field. So look for a shielded ethernet cable if you're gonna buy a new one. And then admittedly, most of us have multiple devices around our houses today. So you can plug them all in and just take the main cable from your router to this little switch box. You can think of it as an extension cord for electronics. It's little. This is the little five one that I'm showing here that I got in my house. And then just get a separate little ethernet cable for each one of your devices and then an adapter. So this one that I'm holding here is called the Lightning to RJ45 ethernet adapter. Lightning to four to RJ45 Ethernet. This is what I can use to plug my iPhone in if I wanted to, and then I could access everything on the internet um, going through a cable that's plugged into the back of my router. And then you just go in and turn off all of the antennas in your device, and they're sneaky, so you really do need to measure. So step one is get the cables and the connectors that you need to go into your devices. Step two is to go in and turn off all of the antennas. I didn't know how to get them out of my router, so I just called up our, our carrier and I said, hey, we're choosing the faster, more reliable, safer connections through, through cables. How do I get that box, that triple play box and stuff that came with our system? How do we get that to stop radiating? And the tech support guy said, oh, that's easy. Sit down at your computer. And I went, really? He said, yeah, I'm going to walk you through how to get into your account. And he did. He showed me how to go right into wireless settings online. And there was a 2.4 gigahertz and a 5 gigahertz antenna. And I just had to look at each one and go off, off, and then apply. And then it said, you know, you're cutting everybody's Wi-Fi off. And I went, yes, thank you. And then I went back down to my basement where our router is, and I measured and it was no longer sending my meter into the red zone. It was radio silence. It was a beautiful thing. Um, and then I learned that sometimes these companies like Verizon or Comcast or whoever your carrier is will do updates overnight that without you realizing it have turned everything back on. So we had Comcast, oh, we had Verizon to start with. And then my husband saw a better deal with Comcast Xfinity. And so he contacted him and said, we're tempted to go with your service, but you're going to have to guarantee to my wife that there will be no radio frequency emissions from the equipment that you installed. And the guy said, no problem. So the tech shows up at my house. We had three different cable boxes installed. So he was here for a number of hours, switched out the modem. And I said, okay, humor me. And I come down with my meter and I measure and it's off the charts. And I said, okay, you got the 2.4 gigahertz antenna off, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, you got the five gigahertz antenna turned off. And he says, yeah. I said, and then I understand that Comcast is putting public hotspots inside our homes on these routers to throw signal out to the curb to service your customers, which is using our electricity, first of all, that's just a raw deal for us but sending signal far out. So you know if it's going far out, it's going through you and everybody in your house to get there. I said, did you turn off the 2.4 gigahertz hotspot and the five gigahertz hotspot? And he said, I did. I said, so why is this router still pulsating off the charts? And he says, I don't know. So he spent a couple hours down there trying to figure it out. He called his tech support. They didn't know. He called his manager. They didn't know. So he said, we're going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to bring my supervisor with me. So at that point, I remembered that I had heard Peter Sullivan from Silicon Valley when we were at the medical conference. I sat at the same table with him while we were having lunch and I was on the periphery of the conversation. And I heard him talking about a fifth antenna that was in that router. So I contacted Peter and said, Peter, what was that? 
And he said they are equipping those routers with home Wi-Fi security system antennas. And I didn't even have a security system like that, but that antenna was turned on. So I thought, you know what? I don't want to play this game anymore. And so that night, my husband went out to one of the big box stores and got a router that we had an off switch to. So we could turn those antennas off ourselves. So the next day when the uh, tech guy and his supervisor came to my house, I told them what I had learned and they were really grateful to learn because Peter had taught me that your frontline tech support has no idea. You need to ask for a tier two tech support person, which will get you to an engineer. And from the engineer's side of things, they can get into your system and turn off that other antenna, but you have no control over it. So I said, I don't want to play that game. I showed him the router that we had bought for a couple hundred dollars and it pays itself back because <clears throat> on your internet service provider bill, you're paying like 10 something a month for use of their router. So when you take that off the bill, it will pay itself off in a couple of years. So as a gesture of good faith, they were very accommodating when I said, would you please just install this one for me and take that other one away? And they were more than happy to do so. So some of these guys are really great. I know down in Virginia, Doris Kinnick had been my guest on this program a month or two ago. And she called her internet service provider when her kids got sick from the Chromebooks during the pandemic. And they came in and for like $100, their internet service provider just hardwired their house and gave them a router that didn't transmit. So... They don't do that up where I live, but you could ask. You never know if they might do it where you live. So again, not rocket science to fix. Hardwire, turn off the antennas, and then make sure you measure because there are sneaky antennas in just about everything you could buy today for 5G and the Internet of Things. Okay, so that's what you have direct control over in many of our situations. Um and then there are other sources of these electropollutants that you may or may not have control over. One of them is the utility smart meters. When I was a little girl, I'm one of 10 children, so we were outdoors all the time. We got a rousing game of hide and seek going. I'd be hiding in the bushes and it could be a while before I got found because there were 10 of us and whoever's friends were hanging out. So I'd sit in the bushes and I would, you know, kind of watch the little dials go around on our utility meters for gas, water, electric, and today it's solar, propane. Um, and those used to be good analog mechanical meters that had no radiation transmission. Then innovation, the industry started approaching our towns and saying, hey, you know how you're paying those guys to walk the neighborhood and get the readings every month? Wouldn't you like to save some money? How about if we do that digitally? How about if you get rid of those analog meters and get these new meters that will allow you to not have to pay that person anymore and the signal will go automatically from the home to a collector site right off to the utility company? Doesn't that sound like a great deal? Well, who would know any differently? So that's what they did. So they've been rolling out all these smart meters for electric, for solar, for water, for gas, for propane. If you look at yours and you see an FCC ID number on it, that's your clue that it is transmitting electromagnetic radiation. Now the industry will tell you, oh, it just does it a, a few seconds a day. When I took my meter, and I sat down in my living room on the floor against the wall where these are mounted outside. We have one for electric and we also have one for our solar system. I measured, and when I did the math, it came up to 17,000 times a day that thing pulsed a spike of microwave radiation into my home. So these are not healthy for us. And every community should have the right to opt out of these. So again, I mentioned that one of the properties of this radiation is it amplifies around metal. So if things are not installed properly, that radiation signal can hop on the house wires and pipes and turn your whole home into one giant toxic antenna. 
there are so many reports of these things catching fire if there's a power surge, explosions, improper grounding. Um, and many people really care about their data. And what we have now found out is this is a huge data harvesting opportunity for industry to take your data and sell it to third-party vendors, or perhaps even to people with nefarious intent. Um, and at the EMF medical conference, they said that when these digital utility meters go on, they see an uptick in people who are starting to get microwave sicknesses. And this is also an environmental justice issue here in Worcester, Massachusetts, National Grid came in and rolled out their smart pilot grid program, meaning they were putting this on everybody's homes in Worcester, people were getting sick. And uh, they do this quite often with toxic products. They'll go into impoverished, low economically suppressed, high racial minority communities where perhaps there are language barriers or where people are working two or three jobs just to try and keep food on the table and a roof over their head and they are not able to be tuned into what's going on in the community. They'll roll out these toxic products and then go, hey, look, this was great in Worcester. Let's roll it out all across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Hey, New York. Hey, Rhode Island. Hey, Connecticut. Look how successful this was. You're falling behind. Get on the bandwagon. And that's what these industries do. So there's a really good TED Talk by a Silicon Valley engineer named Jeremy Johnson. You know, again, know your audience. If you want to open this conversation with someone who's tied to technology, maybe hearing it from an electrical engineer would be of use. Jeremy is married to a woman who's a medical doctor, and they both suddenly got very sick and nothing in her medical training could figure out what was going on. Well, it turned out that a smart meter bank went in on their condo. So Jeremy does a really good TED Talk on this. And Dr. Alexi McKnight, ironically, is a radiologist. She works with man-made radiation for her career. And she had no idea about the low-level, non-ionizing, non-thermal radiation until a smart meter went in on her home. And she got so poisoned neurologically that she was out in traffic with her daughter in the car and could not remember if that green light meant stop or go. And thank goodness she made the 50-50 gamble and made the right choice and got home safely. But she's done a TED Talk on this as well. So we have our own devices and we have utility smart meters. Next, let's, let's look at the initial cell towers that came in. 300 feet up in the air in industrial parks, far away from residential areas, far away from our churches, far away from our playing fields, far away from our medical facilities. And then because the industry wrote their own law back in 1996 with this telecom act, they put something in there. One, you can't complain about health issues or environmental issues well, environmental issues, and a couple of the circuit courts have interpreted that to mean health issues, but others have not. Um, they said you can't come after us legally because the law says we're protected. They also said that, hey, so long as it looks, looks aesthetically pleasing, we can pretty much put these wherever we want. So instead of just being far away from us, they started encroaching and getting closer and closer and now we've got them putting them on the rooftops. We've got them putting them on the sides of the buildings. And now people are getting very sick and their doctors have not been trained. So it's critically important that we look at the non-industry funded science. This is my personal research repository because I got in way over my head and then I couldn't remember where I found credible resources that I wanted to revisit or share with others. So being a tech writer, I just built this very simple research repository called Understanding EMFs because <laughs> I didn't understand what these electromagnetic fields were doing to us. Um, but I've set it up in such a way that I can get back to information quickly through the navigation to the science, to the military experts, you know, cancers, infertility, impact on children, Wi-Fi in schools, electrosensitivity, and then the smart meters, the cell towers, 5G and planetary impact and so on. So if anything that I have put together can help you to connect the dots quickly 
If you go to Massachusetts for Safe Technology on our resources page, you will find all of these separate pages listed out for you. So here on the cell tower page, we see the science documenting that in real time, and I learned that um, the studies that are done out in society, they're called epidemiological studies. They have identified tumors of the brain and heart, right? We know about through the NTP study and the Ramazzini studies. We also know that when you look at society, you see these harms happening on this death and neurotoxicity curve that starts to come down at about 500 meters in distance from these cell towers and big macro antennas. These statistics don't actually catch up. They start coming down at 500 meters or 1,640 feet. They don't actually come up to regular society statistics till almost double that. So the 500 meter mark is already a compromise. So um, there's lots of science there. You can also go to a website called antennasearch.com here in the US and put in an address and it will give you a three mile return of the radius of where these cell towers are in your area. And it'll run a report for you that looks something like this with the cell towers and the antennas. This is one neighborhood in Boston um, in Hyde Park. Look at how electropolluted that is. When I put in the state house address in downtown Boston, look at all these dots on this map here. There are 1,520 towers with more than 4,500 of these massive antennas that transmit for miles. So the electropollution in our cities is just outrageous now. And a lot of people can't go into our big cities anymore because as soon as they do, they start getting all those symptoms. So those are the big macro antennas that we started with. And then the industry started adding 5G. There's something called the electromagnetic spectrum that shows where all of this radiation falls. You know, on the far end, you've got the sun, you've got the x-rays, you know, all that in the ionizing part. And then you've got the non-ionizing part. And so we've got the cell towers, all of our devices, the radio stations, the TV stations, you know, the cordless phones, all of it. The only thing that looks left to be monetized is the little frequency band that they're now spinning up as 5G. 5G simply means fifth generation technology. Our friends in Hawaii at uh, Safe Tech Hawaii have done a nice little five or six minute video on what 5G is and isn't. Feel free to look at that. So it's fifth generation technology. It came after 3G or 4G and 2G and 1G, um, but it's not defined through specs. Every carrier calls it, does something different and still calls it 5G. It's a marketing term. And they're spinning it up that we're gonna get faster entertainment downloads, smart cities, super highways, et cetera. So they always put all this spin around it. And then what they deliver is crummy wireless technology where you don't get a reliable signal. It's not as fast as everything will get through fiber optics or high-speed copper cables or ethernet. Um, and now take a look as they keep selling us on faster downloads. Look to see, they are buying up the entertainment industry. This is their next revenue stream. So, you know, they own mainstream media. It used to be we had 50 mainstream independent media outlets and they got bought up and they got bought up and they got bought up. And now if you go and look to see who owns mainstream media, it's the same four to six country or companies that own these telecom companies too. So they control full messaging to what we get unless we know where to go to look for credible information. So 5G as it stands today doesn't stand alone. They're still using the frequency spectrum for what they started with for 1G through 4G. And now they're saying these little tiny millimeter waves, so the bigger wavelengths for 3G and 4G can penetrate a building and everything in its path to get to your wireless device indoors. That's how it's working. 
all that's left are these tiny little millimeter waves and they're spinning it up that you're gonna get these wicked fast speeds. But those little waves can't go very far and they get disrupted by anything in its path, trees, rain, snow, buildings, mountains. So what's their solution? Let's bring those 3G and 4G powerful, potent, long wavelengths at close range and add these little millimeter waves in with them. That's what's in all these little canisters that you're seeing going up around our communities. And their goal is to put millions of them in every two to 12 houses inside our neighborhood, right outside your bedroom window, like Mary was telling us they were doing in Minneapolis. And here at a time when our cities are trying to address climate change, starting to build out the tree canopies again to cool our cities in the summertime naturally, industry comes in and just starts lopping off the trees so that their little crummy signals will get through. And at a congressional hearing with the Commerce Committee up in DC, Senator Richard Blumenthal said to the industry reps, so please share with us, how much money did the industry spend on independent testing before bringing wireless to market, before bringing 5G to market? And these two industry guys just kind of did the hamana hamana and ultimately were made to say, ah, uh, we don't really know of any testing that's been done. So in this little four minute clip you can watch, thanks to our friends at Environmental Health Trust, you will hear these two industry guys saying, uh, we don't know of any, any safety testing that's been done. And that's the, ba that's the basics. Senator Blumenthal says, so as far as health and safety are concerned, we're flying blind here. And that's where we are today, but we're not flying blind. We know it's harmful. And insult to injury, the trade magazines like Computer World are saying 5G is a bad joke. They're not even giving us faster speeds than what we already had. And when you plug it in through a cable, you'll blow out anything that 4G was giving us. So uh, Dr. Magda Havis was the co-chair of the EMF Medical Conference, and she is a professor emeritus from Trent University up in Canada. She uh, knows, and she's one of the scientists who's done a lot of the research into this, she knows that our governments largely have dropped the ball, and they are, in rare instances, tracking this cumulative effect the cell towers, the small cells, the smart meters, our own devices, our cars with everything that's radiating on them now. Who's looking at that? Well, Dr. Havis is inviting all of us to become citizen scientists. If you choose to purchase this particular meter, because you have to have the same instrument for a scientific study, you can go out to her website at globalemf.net and let them know that you would like to participate in this study and you wanna get one of these meters and they, through the very kind generosity of Rob Metzinger who owns Safe Living Technologies that makes this meter, Rob is offering Dr. Havis a discount for anybody who wants to participate in her scientific study. So if you wanna do that, just reach out to globalemf.net and you will be given specific protocols, bring a friend or like I did, bring somebody from your town. One of you can do the readings with their protocol. The other can write it down on the little clipboard sheet and then enter it into the database. And you'll come up with something that looks like you fall somewhere in here. She nicknamed this her brag project. Can you brag about your town? B stands for blackout. It's more than 100,000 microwatts. R stands for red, 10,000 to 100,000. A stands for amber. 1,000 to 10,000, and G in Bragg stands for less than 1,000 microwatts. In Salzburg many years ago, a lot of the EMS scientists got together and said, you know, if you had a safe living environment and you're out and about, if the out and about outdoors were 1,000 or less, and you had a clean detox environment at home, maybe we could do okay. So that's why we say green is a thousand or less. Here's what some real measurements outside are looking like. The goal is to be at a thousand or less. 
Um, Lori Schreier, who's part of New Hampshire for Tech Safe Technology, she measured at their fire department. It was in the green. She measured in Keene, New Hampshire. It was already getting into the amber. And we did this a couple of years ago. And now they put these 5G small cells right at the curb in Keene. So we suspect that's now in the red. Nashua, red. Concord at the State House, red. Stratum, New Hampshire, black, where they put a giant cell tower right on the main drag. North end of Boston, off the charts, more than a half a million. And industry convinced their neighborhood association to allow them to put these pretty, what look like street, wrought iron street lamps on the main drag. So the North end in Boston, for those lucky enough to have come here, that's where all of our amazing Italian restaurants and bakeries are. But look, right on top of the storefronts, there are what used to be tenement housing units from way back during the war when the immigrants came in. And so now we have apartments and condos right above all of these, right at eye level to these cell towers at the curb. When we measured, we were getting readings as high as 613,000. And then when you go to the crossroads at Hanover Street, you look down there and they put these ugly gray monopoles right up outside people's bedroom windows. So. It is such a raw deal on so many levels. And that's what most of our major cities have become, just totally corrupted with electropollution. But Martin Luther King Jr. has taught us, when we see important changes in society, it doesn't just miraculously happen. It happens because people learn about it and do something about it in three different venues. One, the public becomes informed and gets engaged, which is what we're hoping to do today is teach you and inspire you. Two, it goes through the courts. Three, public policy finally catches up and starts putting top level protections in place, but it's gotta come up from the bottom before they'll ever do anything meaningful. So in the following slides, we will leave you with many wonderful resources in each one of these areas. I'll do a high level overview and then leave it to you to do your own deep dive. So let's look first at what the legal solutions are. The FCC has now been sued. When Dr. Shuren went over to the FCC and said, eh, we don't believe those studies showing cancer and DNA damage, the FCC entered that determination into something called the Federal Register. Once they decided they were not going to update their 1996 public radiation exposure limits, then the lawsuits began. There were many all over the country and they got combined under this main heading with Environmental Health Trust. It also includes the Children's Health Defense and several other parties. They spent thousands and thousands of dollars culling from the public record because the FCC had an open file, an open docket for six years and into that experts like scientists and doctors and advocates and building biologists and people who have lost loved ones or become ill from wireless radiation assaults. Um, all that went into the public record. And so the folks who sued the FCC got the funding and spent thousands upon thousands of dollars getting all of the evidence into a digestible form and they printed it out and they gave each of the three judges in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals 27 big fat binders, 11,000 pages of evidence of harm and turned it over. The judges are looking at this and looked at the FCC and said, well, how did you determine that you're going to stick with these outdated limits from 1996? And the FCC just went, well, the FDA said it was okay. So of course the judges asked, where's the FDA's homework? And we have a huge regulatory gap. Not one of our federal agencies has done the independent investigation into this. So basically the court said that the FCC was arbitrary and capricious and they need to account for the vulnerabilities to children, to the environment, to the elderly, to those with electrical sensitivities, to the infertile. And arbitrary and capricious was new to me. I had to go look that up. It basically means the FCC made it up. They didn't do their homework. We're now going on three years since the court remanded or sent this back to the FCC to do better, three years and they've done nothing. So there's no cavalry coming. It's up to us to get this right. Another encouraging 
fronts, the Massachusetts um, Association of Health Boards has a set of legal guidelines, and they believe that it falls upon the jurisdiction of our local boards of health to protect the citizens. And out in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where Verizon put a cell tower on top of this neighborhood that caused so much sickness that people had to leave, and now we hear of them dying, um, they determined that those FCC guidelines only apply to the application process to site a cell tower or those antennas. Once it goes into the community, if people or the environment are getting sick, it is the Board of Health's job to fix it. So there's a lawsuit right now to remove an injunction that the industry through Verizon put against the Pittsfield Board of Health. Pittsfield Board of Health did this amazing cease and desist order that documented all the harm, that documented that the, you know, the PhD that industry parades around, sure, Eric Swanson is a PhD physicist, but has he ever published one paper on electromagnetic radiation? No, he has no credibility in this field. Um, so it's all well documented in this incredible document from the Pittsfield Board of Health. And now this citizen's lawsuit we hope to hear about very shortly that would remove the injunction that Verizon got the court to put on the Board of Health and let the Board of Health do their job. So the world is watching that one. But there are lawsuits all over the country, all over the world happening that we never hear about in mainstream media. Now let's look at the policy solutions. We helped New Hampshire pass the first law in the nation to do a true investigation to study the environmental and health effects of evolving 5G technology. As soon as they got in there, they realized it's all wireless, not just 5G. They were tasked by law with answering these questions. Why do Lloyds of London and Swiss RE and others long since recognize this as a world leading risk and they have exclusions in their policies so that can leave our towns and schools and our workplaces very vulnerable to legal liability? Why does that, lie, that fine print that we started with today even exist why is the FCC ignoring thousands of studies and why do the guidelines they put in place, you know, decades ago only talk about heat? Why are they ignoring the non-thermal, non-ionizing biological effects? And why do they allow a hundred times more radiation in certain other countries? Um, and why is nobody looking at the effect, not just from one antenna, but from the multiple antennas and our multiple devices and our multiple neighborhoods with all of this pulsating at us. So New Hampshire investigated, even during the pandemic, they stuck to their one-year deadline, talked to world-leading scientists and doctors and other experts, and came out with this groundbreaking report, which is in my signature for any emails you get from me, but you can access it here, documenting the conflicts of interest with our federal agencies in the industry and stating 15 recommendations to transition away from wireless technology and instead bring fiber optics to and through the, pre the premises, educate the public, start getting our federal agencies in line on this and protecting our environment. So this commission report and the Pittsfield Board of Health document are our nation's two strongest documents today that you have easy access to, to credibly open this. Dr. Kent Chamberlain from the University of New Hampshire was appointed to this commission. He is a career engineer who built medical devices using this man-made radiation. He thought this was gonna be a slam dunk. Of course, Wi-Fi is fine until he got in there and started researching. Now, Dr. Chamberlain has done a complete 180 and he's out there working with other experts to inform and to come up with engineering solutions that will bring us safer technology. He goes over the New Hampshire report in about 20 minutes and is happy to share his slides with you. From that report, we then took the recommendations and started introducing new legislation and Every time we've done this, the industry has gotten in there and killed the bills. This year in March in Minnesota, 
Senator Scott Dibble just introduced three bills to take a pause on 5G until they can do their investigation on what it's doing to the environment and the citizens' health, and then give the power to the local authorities to impose that moratorium and put other language in the existing laws on uh, wireless communication facilities. And these three bills are now in the hands of their Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. And these are the legislators who lead that committee. Um, it looks like Judy Seberger, Matt Klein, and Gary Doms. So that's who you should be contacting to tell them to pass these bills. There are bills all over the country now. New Hampshire's got them, Maryland, Connecticut, um, and here in Massachusetts, we lead with six bills. And uh, this smart meter choice bill has been around for 10 years. Our legislators have known about this. This year, Senator Mike Moore put an emergency preamble on it because Eversource and National Grid are looking to replace all their meters and put these toxic smart meters on every one of our homes in 2024 and 2025. The civil rights bill would give everybody the right to have protections as we do with other uh, disability related um, items. And we would also add this to the existing registry at our Department of Public Health to start tracking the number of people who are getting sick from man-made microwave radiation. So there are bills in other states, feel free to go take a peek. And then back to what we can do. The industry comes into our towns and says, eh, nobody else cares if we put a cell tower here. That's just the NIMBYs, the not my backyard people. Well, that's what industry says. You can go out to Children's Health Defense, you can go out to Americans for Responsible Technology and find that there are dozens upon dozens of groups all over this country organizing. And you can look there to see if there's one near you. Here in Massachusetts, we have many citizens working with their towns to get their zoning bylaws updated. So you can't wake up tomorrow to what Mary and her neighbors did, which is industry pulling up in a truck to put a cell tower right outside your bedroom. Many, many, many towns have been working on this and in many cases successfully, but we don't hear about it through mainstream media. We have a lot of this on our news page at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. And then towns themselves start taking action. When we educated Burlington, Massachusetts, they made a committee of all the boards in their town, including health, zoning, you know, planning, um, their city council, all of them got together, hired an attorney because their local attorney didn't really understand the telecom laws as well as an expert does. So they hired special counsel. And then they came up with this groundbreaking small cell policy that stays within the legal framework, but it tells the industry, hey, if we grant you these applications, you're going to have to come back every year and recertify that all of these antennas are still within the law. And we don't have the money for that annual recertification. So you, Verizon, or whatever vendor, are going to have to come back and recertify through an independent consultant and pay them to make sure everything's still above board. Well, when they rolled out that small cell policy in Burlington, the Verizon attorney was there that night, Dan Klasnick, who I've spoken to and really explained this issue, but I keep telling him, Dan, come to the other side. We need good attorneys on this side. Um, he said, my client does not wish to set precedent for an annual recertification or us funding that for every one of these. Because mind you, they plan to install millions of them. That's gonna cut into their bottom line. So they respectfully withdrew their applications for 5G small cells. So when the industry rolls into our town and tells our town, oh, your hands are tied, that telecom act says there's nothing you can do. Well, granted, you may have one finger tied, but you got nine other fingers that you can work with your town to strengthen your local zoning bylaws. Because if you don't have it in your laws, there's not enough time because of these shot clocks industry puts on these applications to get it right. So you need to be proactive. You need to be talking to your town and using the resources that are right there at your fingertips. Americans for Responsible Technology has built a toolkit just for you 
they've incorporated some of the great things from the Burlington small cell policy and other good things from across the nation. And now other towns are following suit. So this is happening in real time. We need to tell our towns about it. And look at what happens. In Easton, Connecticut, a grandmother brought it to their town. They had a medical doctor on one of their boards. They instituted a moratorium until it can be proven safe. And they've re-upped that moratorium recently. In Stanford, Connecticut, experts were brought in to do a session. <laughs> they turned around to their mayor and or their governor and said, um, that deal you've cooked up with industry that would allow 5G small cells at the curb inside our neighborhoods, no thank you. So Stanford, Connecticut rejected 5G. Hawaii residents <coughs> worked with their community and the Big Island of Hawaii, and they wrote a moratorium ban. It didn't have legal teeth, but it sure raised the issue a lot. Um, and actions like this are happening all over the world. So please dive in and get inspired. Folks, we have got to protect our children from that 21st century classroom. Industry rolled into town, everybody bought into it. And we now have a wireless access point on the ceiling of every classroom in this beautiful new elementary school my town just built. I went in with my meter during the open house and it is blood red on the meter throughout. We are frying our children. There are many actions happening though that can help you to protect them today. In Louisiana, uh, Dr. Holly Grow met with other doctors and together they approached the legislature from where they are. Dr. Holly Groh talked about this epidemic of myopia that we now have because kids, kids are spending time in the shallows of a screen at close range when their eyes are meant to be scanning the horizon all the time. That's what keeps the proper shape of the eyeball. And now we've got an epidemic of myopia. Others on her group uh, talked about the obesity issues, talked about healthy lifestyles and the detrimental impact of screen time. So they passed a law unanimously through the House and the Senate and the governor and their state board of health had to work with the techies and come up with school best practices for digital devices. So it can be done. The Netherlands and Finland are taking tech out of the classroom. They see it's too much of a distraction and it is reversing the top scores that they used to have. Silicon Valley executives, New York Times did a great expose in several parts. Silicon Valley executives are sending their children to schools with no technology. They know a child doesn't develop well in front of a screen. They need meaningful interactions with their peers, with the trusted adults, with the natural environment, and they need movement, not sitting there in front of a screen all day. So Silicon Valley execs are taking it so far that they have their nannies sign contracts. There will be no screens around their children. We are very grateful to Tech Safe Schools, the same folks who have Americans for Responsible Technology, started this program for you. If you contact them, they will send a packet of information to your school so you can credibly open this conversation and get others in your community up to speed on this. Uh, the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition has already developed kindergarten through grade 12 curriculum on prevention. Dr. Alexia McKnight, she did that TED talk about the smart meters. She brought me in to do training on her children's district professional development day. We gave four training sessions that day to the teachers and the staff. And you have the recording here, 46 minutes on what our schools can learn and choose to remediate. And here's that course that my little nonprofit puts out so we can train an entire school, an entire workforce, an entire family, a municipality, and about a half an hour online. And then the Environmental Health Trust has many pre-printed or printed options. You can have the electronic file and print it out yourself or send it to your local printer. Flyers, postcards, so many great things. And then Maryland became the first Board of Health at the state level to recommend hardwiring in schools. Um, so folks, there are so many resources here for you. For our healthcare practitioners, we now have textbooks 
for medical school. So for all the techies out there, there are credible resources. And then for our home and work, if you're not a do-it-yourselfer, there's a, a whole industry called building biologists. You can hire one to help you get it right. Look at these great mainstream things on PBS. Watch this award-winning film, Generation Zapped. Most of our library streaming services carry it. And here's that toolkit for you. And then we have great resources for our municipalities as well. Um, so next steps, we can't kid ourselves. There's no safe level of this man-made radiation. We need to push it up from the local to the state and keep educating. Our next session is going to be May 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern, and we can be brought in. I am more than happy to help your professional organizations learn about this. They're always looking for public speakers, and that's my happy space. So for you, start talking to your town once you get your own stuff squared away. We need tech safety committees. We need to opt out of smart meters. We need to get this out of our public spaces and get our local zoning bylaws up to speed. And our town should be hiring attorneys who know this backward and forward, like Andrew Campanelli, who used to work for the industry. He's got their playbook. He used to run it. And he has now switched teams to help municipalities and citizens fight this in court. So for today, think about reducing your exposures. Start taking a little inventory. What is radiating around you? Then start taking baby steps. Protect your sleep. Move toward ethernet cables and adapters. Keep everything with those antennas off. And then use these incredible resources at your fingertips. So thanks everybody. I know this has been an action-packed two hours here, but now that you know you're halfway there and it will take you some time to get your head around it perhaps, um, but we're here for you. So you can reach out to Mary Bacon at their website, Minnesotans for Safe Technology. There's her email. Come to my website. We've got a lot of resources there for you or reach out by email and we'll be more than happy to share what we know if it can help you to connect those dots more quickly. Um, Mary, do you want to unmute and let me know if there are any questions in the chat today? No, there's no no questions. Okay. If anybody else would like to raise their hand and ask any questions, we'd be honored to entertain those right now. Okay. Pretty well, thank you guys for sticking with us this long. As you know, we'll do these twice a month. So come back as often as you want. Every, you know, people do, they go and they get their head spinning and then they get the courage to try something, fix it, come back, get inspired again, go back and fix something else. Um, that's what we're here for. So let us know if we can help and we hope you have a tech safe day. We'll send this out shortly. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Mary. I'm so grateful for your time. You too. I'm going to end this and it'll stop the recording.